Our scripture reading for this morning is found in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2. Um, it's actually verses 1 through 12, not 1 through 10. They've corrected it for us in the, in the uh, PowerPoint here, which I'm very thankful for. I invite you to follow along with me. I'll be reading out of the New Revised Standard Version. Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. <coughs> Excuse me. They told him in, Jer- in Bethlehem of Judea, so far, uh, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. From, for from you shall come a ruler who is, shepherd, who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay homage. When they they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that that they had seen at its rising until it had stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening the treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in in a dream not to return to Herod, they left from their own country by another road. May God add the blessing on the reading of his word today. Would you all pray with me, please? Loving God, in this hour and in this place, I ask that you grant to me the gift of preaching. May the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth bring glory to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And to the beloved gathered in this house, I ask that you give to them the gift of hearing, that our time together be one in which we go closer to you and to each other as we continue to give ourselves to your service. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I have uh, read this passage my whole life, and I've always struggled with one central question. Why did the Magi follow that star? Why do they leave their homes? Why do they leave their families? Why do they leave the people who spoke their language and understood their culture to embark upon a journey into the unknown with only a star to guide them? Would you? I don't think I would. But the Magi did. Their journey wasn't some sort of fluke, it wasn't a whim, it wasn't a joke, it wasn't a journey because they didn't have anything else to do, there was a purpose for this journey. But what was it? Were these magis bored with their lives? Were they searching for deeper meaning? Was there something missing? Had they believed that they were following a star that would provide them with the answers to the mysteries of life? Many people will simply say that the Magi were simply astrologers, people who studied and specialized in the Zodiac, but the Magi were much, much more. They were ancient scientists who studied the movements of the stars, the planets, the sun, and the moon, and would study their impact that it would have on the earth and its inhabitants, the people, the crops, the animals the weather patterns, anything that would support life. They would see how the heavens would affect that. It eventually grew into a science that we call astronomy. Keep in mind, in the ancient world, ancient Persia, ancient Babylon, at this time and place, were the front runners 
of scientific discovery. During the time of the Crusades, all of the records were almost destroyed if it weren't for a few of wandering Bedouins who sacked them away for safekeeping. The decision to follow the star for this new king or whatever it was was to be a discovery, and they wanted to be the person whom this star would represent. They wanted to understand what it was going to be. They saw something special in the sky. It stirred in their souls, and they followed it. They had a very long journey ahead of them. From their homeland in the east to the babe in a manger. Over 400 miles across the Arabian desert. That's an arid, long, painful trek. It's like having to drive from here to Chicago without a radio, a CD player, or your, or your phone to play music. When you have to take a long trip, do you look forward to it in silence? Or do you find a way to placate your mind? Me, I'm one who doesn't mind having the radio turned off. I used to travel across country two, three times a year when I lived in different places for my education. And I would look forward to this solitude, this quiet time, to let my mind unwind on the things that had been wrapped up in. And if it was an especially long journey, there would be a point that I would start to dread. Because after I unwound all the stuff that I had wound myself into, I, my brain started then to attack and unravel problems that I had had brewing underneath the surface that I wasn't aware of. The reason why I wasn't getting along with people, I was being a putz. You know? The reason why things weren't coming together is because I was trying too hard to force it into a mold of what I wanted. The reason why I was being so alone when I was around, surrounded by people, I wasn't being that social. My aloneness allowed me to unwrap this mystery and unlock it. And invariably sometimes what I would find is an emptiness, an aloneness, an incompleteness. And I would just be baffled by it. Now in my younger years, and when I mean younger as I'm going to talk about in my teenage years, when I would have these types of feelings, my dad would simply say to me, Paul, sometimes you have rough days. Sometimes you feel alone. What you got to do is you got to find the happiness to get you through. What do you mean, Dad? What if I don't have any happiness in this day? Then go to the day before and remember the happiness of that day. What if it's not there? Then go to the day before. Go back as far as it takes, take that happy moment, hold on to that feeling, and bring it up into the present. Now, for a while, I did that, and I figured, okay, that was enough. But as I got older, looking for that happiness to hold on to wasn't enough. You see, what I was doing is I was embracing things that I had created, things that I had put into place, trust that I had built. I was holding on to me. Today, if I was in that emptiness, my father would say, Paul, what do you have to feel empty about? You got a loving wife? You got a nice home? You got a decent kid? What's there to be empty about? But there are still times that the emptiness creeps in. And I have to sit here and say, as much as I loved my father and as much as I respected his tidbits of wisdom, on this one I will respectfully disagree. For my father is promoting me to look to myself for my peace. And the true peace comes from Christ. There's nothing that I can do or any of us can do to make things right. All we can do is let go, release, and follow. Here on Epiphany Sunday, we talk about celebrating the light of the world, Jesus Christ being born, the manifestation of human and divine becoming one and being laid in that, man in that manger. All the hope, all the joy, all the expectation, all the wrongness and brokenness of the world will be made right when that baby is born, comes into this world, and gives himself to the world, not only for that moment, but for all the moments to come. <sighs> Loved you, Dad, but I need to respectfully disagree. When I have my feelings of emptiness and loss and abandonment, it's like my soul is plunged into a dark, endless winter, where I feel cold 
and alone. I see whatever joy that I've had that I used to hold on to, my family, my education, my accomplishments, they've almost been taken from me, swallowed up by the darkness, and there is nothing left that I can use to pull me out. I wonder, I just wonder, if the Magi were in a similar emotional place, and that in taking this journey out of their own awareness of their emptiness, somehow, with all their religion, all their science, all their wealth, they were running on a spiritual empty. They were struggling to do all that was all that they could, but they had no ways of accomplishing it. They were caught up in a malady that I've come to know as the winter of the heart. The winter of the heart comes down to people who get closed into their lives, trapped, if you will. And here in Michigan, with our long, cold winters, sometimes we'll call it a cabin fever. We chose to close up and huddle near a fire to keep warm, to keep the cold at bay. We venture out as little as we need to. We seem less social when the temperature is low and the snow is high. And if there is a continued prolonged period of time where we are alone, we start to feel empty because we haven't been stimulated. We haven't been challenged. Not in a way that challenges us mind, body, and soul. They say that winter is like a long sleep for nature, but for those of us who don't hibernate, the winter of the heart is very scary because we are forced to become one-on-one within ourselves. I don't know whatever you call it and whenever it happens, but if we stop opening ourselves to the wonders and possibilities that God puts in front of us, The winter of our heart positions us into a perpetual darkness, leaving us in a constant state of emptiness. How many people have you encountered so far that have come through the joyful season of Christmas and their attitude has been ho-hum, big deal, back to school, back to work, life back to normal? Where's the joy? Where's the excitement? Where's the hope? I think the Magi's willingness to follow the star was an indication of their emptiness, but it was also an indication of their receptivity to God. You see, I believe God was calling these Magi's with the star in the sky. They were experts in the heavens. They knew what belonged. They knew where it belonged. They had watched how it shifted over centuries. And here was a star that was brand new. Out of the blue, so to speak, no pun intended, that it was there and it wasn't stationary, but it was in different positions throughout the heavens, almost like dancing and teasing them in a way before they finally got up and took some attention and started to follow it. This was the first time ever in the Gospels, and especially Matthew, a gospel written to the Jewish people. This is the first time that we see God intentionally reaching out to Gentiles, non-Jewish people, through the star. He was reaching over the boundaries of culture, of race, of religion, to share the gift of his son with them. He's offering them salvation, but they have to go on the journey Not only to pursue it, but to receive it. These magis are seekers. Spiritual seekers who are willing to anchor their gaze upon that star and recognize that there is something more powerful of this world, maybe something that created this world, that they are being invited to be part of. They put their trust in this scar, its guidance, its presence, the meaning of hope for the future, while at the same time they are acknowledging their own limitations that they can't make it all happen despite their reputations of who they are as members of the royal court, scientists in the communities, anchor people of their society. They had riches that they offered. A commoner like you or I could not afford a chest of gold a bag of frankincense, a container of myrrh. These were wealthy, elite 
gifts. Maybe the top 2% of the population. Out of their emptiness, they're willing to search for new meaning, new identity, new purpose that perhaps they felt were missing. This may explain why these astrologers from the East would give themselves over to a lengthy, uncharted journey and would also explain why they found the Christ to whom they bow down, they would bow down and worship. This baby, this infant, the son of the living God, the savior of the world. In that manger, they saw someone who would make it possible to become part of something greater than themselves, who could bring warmth to a cold heart and light to dark places. This babe is the only one who could truly bring joy to the world. The heart of winter knows that are cold. The heart of winter knows emptiness. It knows the pain of uncertainty. It knows the meaning of purpose. It knows the need to believe in something beyond itself, but it doesn't know how. The heart of winter, I think, longs to be born again. It wants to test new ideas. It wants to make plans for the future. And throughout the month of biting winds, the human heart continues to ask, who am I? Why am I here? What's the life meaning and what is its purpose? And amid all of our Christian activities, the heart of winter searches for the answer to these. And somehow the Magi knew that the presence of God had come into the world through human birth. That God could now be seen in human form. God could be touched. God could be embraced. God could be offered a gift. And in the presence right there of that stable, God could be worshipped and praised. When they arrived in the presence of the baby Jesus, they knew they had arrived. There was no question. They had arrived at a new understanding of what life was all about. They had arrived at a new understanding of meaning and purpose for their lives. They had arrived at a new understanding of their identity. No longer were they merely sojourners. No longer were they travelers. But they had discovered they had been in the presence of the Almighty God in his Son, Jesus the Christ. They fell to their knees and worshipped him. They gave thanks. They gave themselves. In that humble setting, three men from the East, three foreigners, three men who had not been born into the Jewish faith, Gentiles like us, had found salvation. The story of the Magi is the story of salvation. But not just for them. And here's the pivotal piece that I love. It is salvation for all of us. The story is about us, our winter of the heart. It is out of our emptiness, out of our journey, out of our search for God. The story of the Magi is the search for our own quest of knowing who we are, what we should be like when we find ourselves in the presence of the Christ. Life doesn't make much sense, I don't think, until we can discover who we are, and begin to grow who that person is be, the, God, the person who God has called and created us to become. Despite all of their wealth and power, the Magi wanted to find out who they really were, and the star led them to that point of discovery. That star can lead us there as well. The star can continue to lead us to that Christ child where we can discover our reason for being individually as Christians who come before this altar but as a corporate body who gather in this house and witness to the community outside our doors. If we follow the signs that God gives us, we will discover the presence of the living Christ. 
I don't exactly know how and when people find Jesus. I would like to say that it happens every time I preach on a Sunday morning. I'm not that foolish. Because I've been told in the past that it takes sometimes a few days, a few weeks. I was told one guy chewed on one of my sermons for six months before he got it. He said, what do you think? And I went, I held your attention for six months? Cool. (laughs) But it all happens in different times and places. And we all have these individual journeys that we take. But eventually, if we stay stay, stay true to it, there we go, we get there. Some spend a whole lot of time looking without success. We need to keep in mind that we could do anything. We could be involved in activities. We can be sitting and relaxing. We can be in fervent study. But we can't do it alone. How many wise men made the journey? Three. How many gathered and bowed down? Three. They did it in a group. They didn't do it individually. Those who discover the presence of God in Christ might be hard-pressed to explain what they saw because of the meaning of the epiphany. It might seem a bit unlikely, a bit outstandish, a bit shocking. One man was born in a manger, totally human, totally God, willfully came and sacrificed his life for the world. Does that make sense rationally? Not, oh, I got a headache. Not at all. But God's not rational. His plan's not rational. He created us out of nothing, and he wants us to be one with him, and he sent his son to do that, to break through the winter of the heart, to break through our coldness, to break through our darkness, to give us a light, to give us a beacon, to give us something to follow, and not something something to follow, but someone to embrace and journey with us. The Magi found it, and they took it back home with them. don't know what happened after that. Matthew doesn't follow the Magi story. He follows the movement and the growth of Jesus into his ministry, into his life, into his death, into his resurrection. But it's important to Magi that people who were not Jews came searching, and they weren't rejected. They were embraced. We all have opportunities to be magi, to go on a journey and not understanding what it's about. I always like to try and find some type of little modern anecdotes to add into things. And out of one of the celebration magazines that I was reading in preparation for this, I read about a story that happened right after 9-11. During the time of 9-11, with all the degree and all the cleanup, it happened in the news that one of the coordinators who was there almost 24-7 had fallen and hurt their hip and were having problems getting around. And they showed in the local, local news of this person hobbling, trying to get all the things done. So this elderly woman, we never knew her name, from the Bronx, and the only reason why we know that is because she said, she scribbled her name that said Bronx. New York after it. It's the only thing they could read. She walked down from her home in the Bronx to where Ground Zero was, made it through all the security, made it to the Saint, to the Episcopal Cathedral where the care was being taken care of, and she left her cane. And she turned around and hobbled home. No one knows why she did this. Only she does. But she saw a need. She saw someone trying to accomplish something. And she gave of herself to make it happen. God gave of himself in giving us his son to make salvation possible. The Magi gave of themselves into the journey to receive that salvation and to take it back to their homeland and share the good news. 
what are we going to do with the light of the world? What are we going to do with the gift of the Christ child? How are we going to stop and look back and say, wow, that's been a journey up to this point, and there's the future, and I have no idea what it holds, but I know God does. How are we going to react? How are we going to embrace? How are we going to move ahead? I don't have any answers to give you except knowing that our God will be there, challenging us, teaching us, stopping us to give us moments of rest so we can prepare to take the steps into the future, that the coldness and emptiness that you may have about what's unfolding in your days, of head, uh, days ahead, well, you'll have a beacon and a light and someone to follow, someone who will be before you, someone whom you can embrace, someone who's been there, someone who will understand. It was there for the Magi. It was there in that woman who brought her cane from the Bronx. And I know it'll be there for us. We just have to be like the Magi and that woman from the Bronx. And just go on the journey, because God is calling us. That is how we get through the winter of the heart. Would you all pray with me, please? Loving God, be our beacon of light. Be the warmth that warms our money, our, our mind, body, and souls. Be the embrace that never lets us go. Be the blanket that we can always cuddle in and seek shelter and warmth. But be the one who's always reminding us that you are there. Giving us hope. Giving us courage. Giving us meaning. Giving us purpose. So, not, so we can not only receive your peace, but share it as well. We ask this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen.